There are many different types of birth control and family planning methods available to people. Birth control commonly refers to various methods used to prevent pregnancy. But there are other end results of using birth control that people should be aware of. On today's At the Forefront, we'll talk with physician experts about 10 of the most common myths concerning family planning and contraception. That's coming up right now on At the Forefront. We want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. Let's start off by having each one of you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do here at UChicago Medicine. And as always, we are practicing our uh, COVID uh, precautions by socially distancing. So we'll start with you at the desk and we have another doctor over on the other side of the studio. It's a little awkward, but we're making it work. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us here today. Sure. I appreciate it. I am Neha Bardlodge. Um, I am an OBGYN who is also a subspecialist and fellowship trained in family planning. Um, complex family planning entails miscarriage, abortion, and contraception, kind of complex contraceptive issues. Um, at the University of Chicago, I am the Ryan Center Director um, in the DCAM building, as well as the Associate Fellowship Director of our Complex Family Planning Fellowship. Great. And uh, to the other side of the studio now. Hi, I'm Shivika Trivedi. I am one of the generals in the general OBGYN department. I practice the breadth of obstetrics and gynecology and get to answer a lot of these questions for my patients on a day-to-day -day basis. And so hopefully we can answer some of the questions that you might have and dispel some of the myths that you might have heard. Great. And this is kind of a, uh, will be kind of a fun program because we are talking about the top 10 uh, myths or maybe misconceptions or just ideas about family planning and birth control. So we're going to go right through those and uh, try to determine uh, what people's questions are and we'll get the best answers from our experts. So we're going to start off. Number one is the pill is my only birth control option. And I'm not sure who wants to start with that one. Is Dr. Trevetti, would you sure. uh, like to take that one? Um, so there is a misconception that birth control pills are the only type of birth control that exists. And typically people are talking about both um, pills that contain estrogen and progesterone. There's a lot of times where that is not a applicable or appropriate contraception for someone. And so they might think that they actually can't take any contraception. Um, when in actuality, there's a number of different forms that birth control comes in, including pills, patch, shots, a ring that you can put in the vagina. There's longer acting versions as far as um, implant in your arm, IUDs that have hormone or don't have hormone. And then there's also methods that are considered barrier methods, um, condoms, female and male condoms, or also surgical methods of um, providing contraception. You know, it's interesting whenever we discuss this, we, we tend to talk about women and birth control a lot, but it's, it's not 100% on the woman, and it shouldn't be, quite frankly. There's, there should be some, some equity there, and I think men have to take responsibility as well. So there, mm. there are options there as well. No, thank you for bringing that up. Sure. You know, I, I wish there was a little bit more equity in the world of contraception, <laughs> no. yeah. um, but soon to be, hopefully. Sure. Uh, but at this point, the only kind of male-focused contraceptive method that we have is the external condom. The internal condom is definitely more um, female-focused but the external condom is there. Hopefully in the coming years, we'll have more contraceptive technologies, uh, but that's all we have right now, unfortunately. And there's also some surgical options too. So, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I like number two, because I think this is a, an area where people fall into some, some issues and potentially some trouble sometimes. So number two is if I'm using birth control, I don't need to use condoms. And that can be a little dangerous. I mean, so condoms and birth control, condoms can be used as contraception, as Dr. Zervedi was talking about. It's a great barrier method. Um, condoms really are the only form of protection against sexually transmitted infections that we have. So when we think about birth control in general, yes, definitely condoms are a part of that. But when we think of sexually transmitted infection protection, condoms are still the gold standard. When we use birth control, other methods, such as hormonal methods that Dr. Zervedi was talking about or other forms, um, if you still want to protect against sexually transmitted infections, then condoms are still the best option for you. Yeah. Dr. Trevetti, do you see a lot of patients that, that have that as a, as a common misconception that, that think they're fine because they do that and they're protected across the, yeah. across the board? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of patients, just like Dr. Bhardwaj was mentioning, that you know they think that if I, both ways, that if I am using condoms, that that is going to be the best form of 
contraception, which we know there's more effective methods of contraception to prevent pregnancy. But then on the flip side that, oh, well, I'm not going to become pregnant and that's all I have to worry about. But if you have multiple partners or even if you have one partner and aren't in a monogamous relationship or haven't been tested, it is possible to contract STDs. And there are a number of STDs that we don't we don't generally test for, including HPV. Women are tested, men are usually not tested, and that's something else that can be prevented um, by using condoms. I, I'm glad you brought up HPV, and, and I know that's not one of our, our 10 here, but I do wanna talk about that if we can, just for a minute, because I think it's important, particularly with some of the changes that have happened uh, in, in the landscape in the past few years and the ability to, to uh, um, uh, get vaccinated. So can can you kind of walk us through that? Because I know even the ages have changed. So I don't know who wants to take that one first. Yeah. So um, previously when the HPV vaccine came out, it was initially targeted towards just females um, and it was only available up to the age of 26. At that point, unfortunately, there was still a good degree of vaccine hesitancy. And then a lot of folks kind of aged out of that 26 year old um, threshold. And then pretty quickly after that, the, the effects and benefits of the HPV vaccine were noticed. And so it became something that was recommended for both females and males at a very young age, ideally before their sexual debut to prevent them from acquiring HPV. Um, and so now it is recommended for the pediatric population around between the ages of 10 to 12, ideally. Um, before ideally they're sexually active to prevent this and recently in the last probably four to five years i would say um, the fda also approved the hpv vaccine to now be available up to the age of 45 and so in my practice i have found that that is able to capture a lot of females who were in the window that sort of missed it when it first came out um, but maybe now are dealing with having hpv or are sexually active with a group of uh, partners that were not vaccinated and therefore are possibly at a higher risk of contracting and spreading HPV. Yeah, and the HPV vaccine sure, is such sure. an exciting vaccine mm -hmm. in that it's one of the only vaccines that we have that really prevents cancer. So we're exactly. talking about cervical cancer, anal cancer, um, throat cancer, pharyngeal cancer. It really touches upon a number of issues and it's so rare to have that opportunity to protect your child against these cancer possibilities. Well, and it's, it's exciting to me that that age range has moved too, because I think a lot of people, there was a time period where people didn't know what this was and, and didn't know you could be vaccinated and maybe your children were kind of on the bubble, so you, you, you didn't have it done, but now you can. And uh, to your point, uh, there, there are so many benefits. It's, it's just so important. Great. Um, we are on to number three, I think. Yeah, number three. You need to have a period every month. Is that true or false? So that is false. Um, you know, if you are, have, um, if you for some reason are not having a period every month, we definitely want to do an evaluation to see if that's due to other medical issues or certain medications or something else environmental. Um, however, if you do have a regular period every month and you want to be on some sort of hormonal contraception for either birth control or other non-contraceptive benefits, then you don't actually physiologically need to have a period every month. Yeah. It's kind of taking periods and birth control and separating them a little bit. Um, it's more that periods sometimes can be very uncomfortable for people mm -hmm. or can have some real medical um, disadvantages. For example, those that have endometriosis don't necessarily want to have a period every month or ovulate every month. Um, and so we can definitely do that either for medical reasons or for comfort as well. And, and there's, there's also, I, I think a lot of times people too, women, if they think, if they've missed their period, they're, they think automatically that they're pregnant. And that's not necessarily the case. No, you're right. Um, and another misconception that I've heard before, just kind of question, is that if I do miss a period, does that mean that I have blood kind of collecting in my body that's unhealthy and needs to come out? Absolutely not. Your body, our bodies are very smart in that way that if it is time and the lining has thickened and um, your body does want to have a period, it actually will, and that lining will bleed out. Um, so it's interesting that our bodies are really fascinating and smarter than we realize. It is pretty incredible, really, when you think about it. Number four is an interesting one to me because I think, um, again, this is the, these, these are all really good. The number four is only people who are having sex should use birth control, and they're not necessarily the case, is it? No. Um, birth control can be used for a lot of non-contraceptive benefits, such as, you know, if people have really painful um, periods or if for some reason they have another condition where ovulation 
uh, might not be ideal, such as endometriosis, where you can get endometrial implants every time you ovulate or have a period. Um, there are other also issues, such as some people will have menstrual migraines. Um, there's a number of different uh, medical issues that we can talk through with patients to kind of chat with them and see what their comfort level is. Obviously, just because you have a medical condition where it might be optimal to not have your period every month, doesn't mean that you should or need to skip your period. We're really here to just have a discussion and see what patients are comfortable with. Dr. Dravetti, can you talk a little bit about that discussion? Because it's interesting to me, every patient obviously is different and everybody has different wants and needs and, and things going on in their lives. And that's, a, that's, a, that's an important conversation to have. And I think a lot of times, probably people come in with preconceived notions. Would that be accurate? Yeah, for sure. I think that was sort of the reason that we came up with talking about this and wanting to address all of these issues. One of the things, especially with uh, contracept different contraceptive options that we have, particularly hormonal contraceptive options, um, you know, when I talk to my patients, I really try to find out what their three goals are. So one, what their reproductive goals are. Are they trying to prevent pregnancy or are they not? And then secondly, what their desires are regarding bleeding preferences. There are some women who feel more comfortable having a cycle every month. And so some contraceptives that will make it so that it, you have a higher likelihood of not having bleeding are probably not a good fit for you. So really figuring out what you want your bleeding, bleeding pattern to look like, whether you want to have cycles that are predictable, whether you want to have cycles that are lighter, whether you don't want to have cycles or you do, all of those things are really important to bring up and talk to you with your physician about so that they can find out really exactly what your goals are and we can come up with the best contraceptive option for you to try. And if one thing doesn't work, like we talked about in the first question, there's a number of different options that we have to address different um, issues that patients have regarding that they're using contraceptives for as far as heavy menstrual bleeding, painful cycles, like Dr. Bardwaj said, um, or you know, prevention of ovulation for other reasons, as well as even for social reasons, you know, some women who are in the military or have different jobs who don't want to be having cycles or it's too difficult to have the proper kind of menstrual hygiene um, decide to not want to have cycles. So there's a number of different reasons why women might want to choose to not have cycles and might want to use contraception for other um, purposes as well. Interesting. Yeah, there's, there's so much that goes into it. Uh, number five, having your tubes tied is, is reversible. And I this could probably be even a, a broader question just in general with some of these uh, various uh, um, contraceptions or family planning ideas. How much, how many are reversible, I guess? So there are most of the contraceptive methods that we have available are reversible. <clears throat> the one that is not reversible for women is having a tubal ligation. You know, this can be termed a number of different ways, having your tubes tied, having your tubes removed, having clips placed. There's a number of ways to perform a tubal ligation. However, at the end of the day, this is not reversible and should not be considered for those who are even considering possible conception in the future. You know, I will chat with patients. The only way to possibly get pregnant afterwards is through in vitro fertilization. And even then, that's not a guarantee. So this is explicitly for people who do not want to become pregnant again. Again, a very important discussion that you have with the patient and they have to think it through and decide what they want to do. All right, we do have another guest that's going to join us, uh, Dr. McLaren. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll have Dr. McLaren come over and uh, then we'll go through the, the rest of the, uh, the 10 questions, the, the second half, the last five. So we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. We have another doctor joining us, Dr. McLaren. And if you can, just please introduce yourself to our audience and tell us, uh, again, a little bit about what you do here at UChicago Medicine. Hello, I'm Dr. Hillary McLaren. I am an OBGYN with special fellowship training in complex family planning like Dr. Bardwaj. Um, I practice the full scope of OBGYN here at the University of Chicago, here uh, at the DCAM building, as well as our River East location. Great. River East is a beautiful new uh, new location for us, or relatively new. I guess we've, we've had it open now for a year or two, but it's, it is very nice. All right, question number six. Using birth control will make it harder for me to get pregnant in the future. Who wants to, uh, to take that one? Dr. McLaren. Um, I, this is something we hear a lot about because of course a lot of folks are using birth control to prevent pregnancy in the moment. And with the exception of our surgical methods that we were just talking about, like sterilization, um, all birth control methods are reversible. Um, and almost immediately after stopping a birth control method, from the pill, the patch, the ring, to the implant, to an IUD, 
a person's baseline fertility re returns. The one exception I will note is the contraceptive injection or the depo shot, as people call it, mm. um, because it kind of sticks around in your body for a little bit of time, can take up to 10 months for your fertility to return to normal. Interesting. And, and that's, that's one myth I've heard a lot uh, over time is people do think that oh, if I start this, I, I won't be able to get pregnant, but that's just not the, not the case. Very interesting. So number seven, um, using birth control causes cancer. So um, using birth control in short does not cause cancer. There are some kind of, you know, I, I always like to point out how these myths always start out in some sort of basis of reality at some point. Uh, many, many years and decades ago, there were contraceptive methods that were being tested and being developed that then were concerning for developing precancer among those patients. Um, but any forms of contraception that we have that are approved on the market do not and have been shown to not cause cancer. Perfect. And I will add um, to Dr. Bardwaj's point, Indeed, a lot of hormonal birth control methods can actually decrease your risk of mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. um, cancer of the ovary, colon cancer, cancer of the uterus, or what we call endometrial cancer. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I did not realize that. It, it's, it's, uh, it's, that's great information, though. Very good. Um, now I'm, I'm, I'm out of order here, I think. Oh, number eight, I believe, is where we're at. Birth control causes weight gain, or I can't use birth control because I'm overweight. Is that uh, true or false? I'll address that first question because that is something I think a lot of us hear all the time. Yeah. Um, and when we look at big research studies, we have found the vast majority of birth control methods are not associated with weight gain. The one exception of that I will note is that depo shot or the depo injection has been associated with a pretty minimal weight gain that is at increased risk in people who are already overweight. So if that's something that you're concerned about, I'd say that's a method that you might want to avoid. Interesting. And so, of course, that, that answers the second part of the question. If you're already overweight, you, you can use birth control. And, and if, the, if, it's, if the circumstance is right, you, you probably should. Absolutely. I mean, if, if a contraception is what you're looking for, um, for your lifestyle and for your needs, then definitely chat with your doctor about the different methods that might be more beneficial for you um, or the methods that just sound more appealing to you as well. Great. Number nine, emergency contraception ends a pregnancy. So that is absolutely not true. Um, emergency contraception comes in a couple different forms. The most common forms, one is called Plan B, which you can get over the counter without a prescription. And the other one is called Ella, um, and that you do need a prescription for. Ella does prevent pregnancy or helps prevent pregnancy up to five days after your last unprotected intercourse. And Plan B is up to three days or 72 hours. The way that they work is they actually delay ovulation. So if you have not, if you have already ovulated and had intercourse, it will not be very helpful for you. It is tricky to know unless you're doing ovulation procedure kits if you have ovulated. So I still encourage people, even if it's around the time of your ovulation, to take the medication because it will not harm a pregnancy if you are pregnant. And that's a that's a big misconception because mm -hmm. you see that and and again I always pro you see that online and I that's always kind of dangerous right there but. Um, that's a very common misconception, and we've heard it a lot lately, too, it seems like. It is. I mean, so any kind of medication that we give to people where they might be pregnant, by and large, especially as OBGYNs, if we give people medication and we know that there is a concern that there might be pregnancy, we are 100% dedicated to that patient and will know to not give a harmful medication. Great. And our, our tenth and final misconception, then I'll have a question or two for you all after that too, but the tenth and final uh, myth or misconception or question is, I can't use birth control because I have X condition, maybe diabetes or hypertension or something like that. Is, is that uh, true or not? And that, that's something we see a lot as people who are experts in complex family planning, and we are exactly the right person for someone who has those concerns to come see myself and Dr. Bardwaj. Um, there are certain conditions that can really limit uh, what contraceptive options might be available to a person, but there is a breadth of options that Dr. Trevedi was going over earlier in the program. And in conjunction with your specialist who manages that condition, I'm confident that I can always find a method that's going to meet a patient's needs while not harming them in any way. That's great. And I guess my 
we've, we've gone through the 10 and you, you all had fantastic answers. It was really interesting and, and very educational for people. But um, how do people, if, if they want to get more information, if they want to come and visit you, um, this is important and it's not necessarily any age limits on this, uh, it's, it's, but it is important to do. How do they do that? Um, so you can make an appointment with um, either myself, Dr. Bardwaj at um, in DCAM or in South Loop mm -hmm. with Dr. McLaren at uh, River East. And then we have a colleague, Dr. Kaur at Hinsdale and Dr. Thurvedi at um, DCAM and South Loop and in Dearborn Station. Great. And we'll give the general phone number here in just a minute because uh, I think you all, uh, again, the information is just so important and you do a wonderful job and clearly you care about your patients. And I think that's just so important. So um, thanks for doing this today. This was, this was great. This was uh, really interesting and educational. Well, thanks for having yes, us. We really you. appreciate it. Appreciate it. Was Okay, so we are out of time. Special thanks to our guests today, as always, and a big thank you to those of you who watched the program. Please remember to check out our Facebook page for our schedule of programs that are coming up in the future. To make an appointment, go online at youshikakomedicine.org, or you can give us a call at 888-824-0200. Thanks again for being with us today, and I hope everyone has a great week.